Well, hey kids, here I am, huddled up in a little hotel room, not real pleasant in Panama City, Panama. The wife's back is hurting and the kid is bored. So I'm gonna knock out this little video lecture on the Cold War. What you're seeing, of course, is the mushroom cloud of an H-bomb. And, you know, actually, in some ways, quite beautiful, quite symmetrical, but, of course, the potential end to all human existence, so maybe not quite as beautiful in retrospect. Uh, folks have asked, why the mushroom cloud? Well, what does heat do? Heat rises, pulls up with it with tremendous force, cools, settles, comes back down. So we call this period the Cold War, and you see starting 1945, and I could put an exclamation point there. Why? Because the U.S. and the Soviet Union were allies during the war, and that lasted about nine seconds beyond the end of it. And that's where you start seeing this division. 1990, you could say 1989, 1991. You know what? You can also say a question mark, because as I speak this right now, the United States and Russia, once again, major conflict over the Ukraine. Is this just a continuation of the same U.S.-Russian conflict? Is it that different than the so-called Cold War? Uh, we had a tendency to think, oh, things have ended. The Cold War is over. Perhaps it was never so much about capitalism, communism, other possibilities. Why do we call it the Cold War? Well, first of all, what is it? It is a conflict between the world's two great superpowers, the United States, which represented a capitalist point of view, and the Soviet Union, which was a communist state with allies on both ends of them. Why is it cold? Well, it's obviously not temperature, but that little mushroom cloud, that bomb that you saw, never actually used. So both sides had nuclear weapons, but not used. Obviously, the world would be very different today if that had happened. And we'll explore that in a couple of later units as we look at some of the other regions. And the other thing that I think you'd say, there, there's a tendency where people say, oh, it was a Cold War because there was conflict but nobody was actually killed. Actually, that's not true. We are talking millions, tens of millions die in conflict over that 45 year period. But the battles are not in Europe. They're not the United States. They are in the, as, as uh, historian Vijay Prashad calls it, the darker nations, i.e. it's in Asia, it's in Africa, it's in Latin America. And these are so-called proxy wars. Proxy means substitute. No, the United States and Soviet Union don't go head to head, but let's say in Angola, the United States sponsors South Africa, who is fighting against a army that is sponsored by the Soviet Union. The Korean War is never the United States against the Soviet Union, but the Soviet Union is heavily providing weapons. The United States does not go to war in Afghanistan against the Soviets, but the United States sure does provide the weaponry and support for those fighting the Soviets. So that's kind of what we're looking at in terms of a proxy war. And you see that term, by the way, the third world. It's one that's not particularly used, but in order to understand how the world divided up after World War I, there was a common, common way of thinking about it <clears throat> in which you had the United States and its capitalist allies, the first world, the Soviet Union, its communist allies, the second world, and again, the darker nations, all the others that are not necessarily strictly aligned as the third world, today more commonly called the developing world. Causes, look, economics, capitalism, communism, people go to war over money, people fight over money. Look, if the United States had no access to the controlled markets of big parts of the world and they only dealt with the Soviet Union and their allies, that would hurt the United States economically. If the Soviet Union, which wants a more closed and controlled market, is not able to trade with many parts of the world, get resources, that economically hurts the Soviet Union. I think there are political differences as well. Um, I think for a capitalist to say, look, in the United States, we look at the Soviet Union, their anti-religion, their limitations on freedom of expression, freedom of speech, they don't have real elections. This is just simply morally, politically wrong. And from the Soviet perspective, from the communist perspective. We see these wealthy societies with a massive gap between the rich and poor. We see a society run entirely by the wealthy. We see so much hypocrisy in this. My God, during the Great Depression, people were going hungry in the United States. Well, what did US farmers do? They didn't feed people. They destroyed their excess crops and let people get hungry because there was no profit in it. So there's a very genuine moral argument on both sides, moral, political. 
And again, it's 2022, and the United States and Russia are at each other's throats over the Ukraine and other issues. Look, was 1945 to 1990 the first time that the two great powers of the world came into great conflict with each other to try to gain more control than the other? That's as old as history. That's as back as far, you know, thousands of years. Maybe this is just another example of we're very powerful, we're very powerful, and there is going to be conflict because we want the power that you have. I think you can make an argument for all of those, and the answer probably is all of those. You know what? The Soviet Union didn't trust the United States. After, after, after World War I, there were U.S. troops actively fighting in Russia after the peace treaty had been signed. Didn't have a major, major impact, but were fighting against the Bolshevik government and helping to assist people that were the so-called White Army, the White Army that was fighting to get rid of the Bolsheviks. Soviet Union had not forgotten that. Remember that build into World War II, the United States declares war in January of 19, excuse me, December of 1941, and it takes two and a half years to launch that invasion of France. And what happens in those two and a half years? Well, 20, 25 million Russians die. There were military reasons for this. Soviets never believed this was anything more than waiting for the Soviet Union to bleed itself dry as well. Russia's history, and this really does tie into the present day. Russia was invaded in 1914, again in 1941, and we're not going to trust people that may not like us or that want what we have not to invade us again, particularly after using 20 million people in World War II, and that number may be closer to 25 million. And you know what? Why distrust the United States? The United States has that atomic bomb, the thing they dropped in Hiroshima, Soviets don't have this. The United States is a major advantage. And legitimately, ideological hatred of capitalism. It is wrong. It is exploitative. End of the story. The United States didn't have a collectively better feeling toward the Soviet Union. After all, Russia had pulled out of World War I. They just abandoned us. How do you trust people like that? And then 22 years later, Joseph Stalin signs that non-aggression treaty with Adolf Hitler, allows Hitler to invade Poland. And of course, Russia, the Soviet Union, invades the other half, the eastern half of Poland. How do you trust somebody like this? After World War II, you may vaguely remember, we'll certainly cover this, the Soviet Union had said, well, we are occupying Eastern Europe, but don't worry, we're going to allow free democratic elections. And they don't do that, not at all. How do you trust somebody that goes back on their words? The Soviets were pretty clear. We are going to hang capitalism with the newts that they produce. Capitalism is doomed to failure. We will destroy it. Real concern for the United States, although it tends to be overblown, that the Soviet Union may not be happy controlling the countries of Eastern Europe, but might actually move into Western Europe. And yes, just as people in the Soviet Union deeply hated and distrusted the ideas behind capitalism, it, it doesn't take a lot to look at the Soviet model, at the gulags, at the um, famine that was enforced upon the Ukraine, upon the anti-freedom speech that you hear, the idea that you don't have the right to say and do what you want to do. Communism is just pure, inherently evil. And this is how the United States would have viewed the Soviet Union. Coming out of this, in April 1945, remember the League of Nations after World War I failed miserably. Major difference, the United States is a part of it. After World War I, the United States retreated back into its isolationism. After World War II, particularly with nuclear weapons and missiles that are being developed, this is not a possibility anymore. We won't go much into this, but the United Nations has, of course, expanded greatly. But there are two major bodies. The General Assembly, every country recognized, has a vote. The General Assembly, though, really has moral force. It can't take any action at all. The real action is taken by the Security Council. Any given time, there are 15 countries on the Security Council. Ten are appointed on a rotating basis for three-year terms. But the other five, the U.S., the Soviet Union, today Russia, China, France, and England, are permanent members. And this is important because these five countries can veto any resolution that is passed. Meaning, if the United States or the Soviet Union or China do not approve of an action, 
the United Nations can't do much of anything. Certainly a lot of talk today about how that needs to be expanded, how what about the Muslim world with 1.3 billion people? What about India? What about Germany, which has an economy far greater than France or England? What about Brazil with 200 million people or Indonesia with 200 million people? Uh, what about the entire continent of Africa? You will notice that four of these five countries are Western based, the Soviet Union, both in Asia and in Europe, but primarily focused on the West. And then you have China. So yeah, major arguments about how that should change. It's hard to see the United States or Russia giving up all that power that it has right now. England and France, who are really in over their heads, they're not major military or economic powers, at least not super elite ones like they were before World War II. Why would they want to give up the type of power that they're given? So what are these things? That looks like a cake and it's in a, and that looks like apple juice in a, oh, these are Tupperware. That's what they are. They're Tupperware. You know what they are? They are containers. And this is a policy of containment. If I were in the classroom right now, I would hold up a cup and I would have a little pitcher of water. And I would say, I would like to drink some water. And then I would pour it on the floor. And you'd say, why did you do that? It's spread all over the place. Ah, I will pour it into a container which contains and controls that water. This is the name given to the US foreign policy toward communism after World War II. So the idea was, look, there were people initially, as soon as World War II ended, there were people in the United States military that said, this war is not over. Now we know to go after the Soviet Union. We have nuclear weapons. They don't. We are stronger. They are on the edge. Let's finish the job and control, make, make Europe entirely, the world entirely, a democratic socialist outlet. Many, and I think smarter people in the United States, decided that World War III was probably not a super good idea at this point. The United States policy then was officially, and there's debate about this, was not to defeat communism, not to destroy the Soviet Union, but to stop it from spreading or containing it. Here's a little timeline we're going to come through that I put together. Everything in blue is a U.S. or NATO action and you'll see the counter actions or actions in red coming from the Soviet bloc. We'll come back to this as, as we move through it. First step is the Truman Doctrine. Harry Truman, U.S. President, 1945 to 1953. Remember that Franklin Roosevelt dies in April of 1945, just before Germany's surrender and a few months before the A-bombs that Truman ordered dropped on Japan ended the war altogether. Now let's go back a little bit. You'll remember that in 1940, all of Western Europe had been conquered by Nazi Germany. England was receiving round the clock bombardment. This is the Battle of Britain, which is in the fall of 1940. That looks like England itself may collapse. Remember the Soviet Union is not at the war at this point. And the most that the United States with its most loyal allies against a horrific force of Nazi Germany, that all the United States is willing to do is say, well, we're not gonna get involved, but perhaps we could find ways to loan you some weapons, but we don't want to get involved. Now that's 1940. Look at what has changed only seven years later. And remember the United States was traditionally isolationist, did not get involved in European affairs, economic trade, but not militarily. Here's what President Truman says in March of 1947. The United States must provide aid to support free peoples who are resisting subjugation by armed minorities and outside pressures. Okay, so the United States must provide aid. Definition of free peoples. Let me tell you, a lot of these free peoples were living under military dictatorships. But from the U.S. perspective, a free people is a non-communist state. Resisting subjugation, being controlled by armed minorities, or outside pressures, i.e. is there a communist guerrilla movement within a country? That would be an armed minority within a country or outside pressures. We're talking about the Soviet Union, common term, the international uh, communist movement. So the US is going to provide financial aid to non-communists. Now, 
Specifically, he asked Congress, and Congress agrees, to provide $400 million in aid to help fight communism in Turkey and Greece. Okay, $400 million, pretty fair amount of money. Today, it's obviously worth a lot more. But again, let's think back to seven years earlier, where England is about to be destroyed and taken over by Nazi Germany, and the United States is willing to make some loans to Great Britain, but doesn't want to get involved. Here, Turkey and Greece, and I gotta guess, your average American would take hours to find either of those countries on a map. What importance is Greece or Turkey to the United States? There is no major Turkish or Greek population in the United States. Something has changed. The world has changed. The United States sees its interests as being intertwined with the rest of the world. So what we're seeing is not a small amount, but a relatively small amount of money to prevent communism from spreading into a specific part of Europe. That's a huge step from 1940. This is, by the way, after World War II, kind of what Europe looks like. And you will see this little line here, referred to by British Prime Minister uh, Winston Churchill, former Prime Minister, as the Iron Curtain. An Iron Curtain has descended across Europe. From his perspective, all the countries that you see in yellow, these are Warsaw Pact members, very much dominated by the Soviet Union, and yes, with communist governments. Yugoslavia, we'll touch on this differently, was a communist nation, but non-aligned and not officially associated with the Soviet Union. The countries in green or bluish green, whatever that would be, these are NATO countries, North Atlantic Treaty Organization members, we'll get to that in a moment, aligned with the United States. And a number of neutral countries as well, Austria, Switzerland, Spain, which remained fascist until 1975, because Franco was never defeated there. So there's that line that you see, Turkey also a member of NATO. By the way, the Ukraine would be in this area here on the border of Romania, Poland, etc., etc. Just if you're thinking about that in today's world. Um, Finland, just the other day, this is now April of 2022, is considering joining NATO because they feel threatened by the so by Russia today. What are these? Why they're dominoes? And it's called the domino theory. This is a guiding principle of US foreign policy. If one country goes communist, its neighbors will follow. And this is the argument, you know, again, it's a metaphor, so it's gonna be pretty imperfect, but the argument was, if we allow any country, friend, enemy, to adopt communism, either forced upon them or on their own, like a virus that will spread to the neighboring countries, and then politically, economically, every other way, the United States becomes weaker in comparison to the Soviet Union. And you've probably seen this, people line up 47,000 dominoes, press the first one and it fans out. That's exactly the idea behind this per se. We can't let any country fall prey to communism. A second step here, George Marshall, 1947, the Marshall Plan. Look at the number. The United States commits to giving 13 b -b 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 billion dollars. Remember, it was 400 million before with our um, with the, the the Truman Doctrine. Here, it's 13 b -b -b billion, which has got to be well over 100 billion or more today. Not loans, simply to give away to rebuilding countries in Europe that have been devastated by the war. By the way, the United States does offer this to the countries in Eastern Europe. The Soviet Union makes them all decline it. They see it as a way of the United States to get its hooks into Eastern Europe. Why would the United States give away such an astronomical amount of money? Again, this is 1947, only seven years earlier. The United States was only willing to loan its greatest ally, Great Britain, while under attack, loaned them money for weapons. Now the United States is just, here you go, $13 billion. How come? Well, genuinely, humanitarian concerns, yeah, there is a horrible refugee problem in Europe. Europe has been bombed out, absolutely. And you have to give the United States credit for this. People didn't like to see that kind of suffering. Secondly, 
if you see the economies of Western Europe, of England, of France in particular, of Italy, suffering, people are doing poorly, people are not able to eat, people are not able to work, unemployment is high, life is miserable. And keep in mind, this is not just a reflection of World War II, because in that decade before World War II, you had the Great Depression. Well, if people are desperate, they might make some different decisions. In other words, the lure of communism. Let's think about how Joseph Stalin took this poor, backwards, desperate country and built it up into a major power. Um, look, communism holds some appeal. And the idea was a poor economy in Western Europe could lead to a rise in communism. And then just purely economically, it's great if Henry Ford Motor Company is making cars, but they have to sell the cars. Well, if you put money in people's pockets around the world, international trade increases, profit grows. You know, this is really kind of a New Deal type program. It is giveaway to spur economic growth. Notice what we're doing. It's still not about using military power, but it is about using a lot of money to stop communism from spreading anywhere in Europe. And this is where we are by 1948. Tricky. Not only is Europe divided between the East and the West, Czechoslovakia and Poland and Hungary and Romania and Yugoslavia. You know, these are all part of the Eastern Europe so-called satellite nations that revolve around the Soviet Union, that the Soviet Union has great control over. But specifically in the post-World War II agreement at the end of the fighting, Germany was divided up between an American, a French, an English, and a Russian sector. The French, the Americans, the English, they said, you know, we trust each other. Let's just bring these areas together, administer them together. The Soviet Union did not trust the others, and they kept their own little section in the eastern part. And then within that, the formal capital, Berlin. Berlin was similarly divided between a Soviet-controlled East Berlin and an American-controlled West Berlin. So you've got West Berliners here within the middle of communist East Germany. Again, looking at our timeline, we've already seen the Truman Doctrine, we've seen the Marshall Plan, and a little bit after, in early 1948, the Berlin blockade. Joseph Stalin announces through the East German government, West Berlin will be cut off. No supplies come in, no food comes in, no fuel, no medical supplies. What is the goal? Well, to force West Berliners in desperation to simply accept being a part of East Berlin, i.e. of East Germany, i.e. of the Soviet bloc. You might ask yourself, what would be the United States response to this? You gotta understand 1948, it's not as if there's a lot of good feeling toward the Germans. I mean, the United States had gone to war against that brutal Nazi German regime, which yes, had been overthrown, but you can understand how there wasn't a sense of, oh, our poor German brothers, unlike let's say the French and the English that we had fought with for so long. But here's the thing. If the Soviet Union is allowed to take that little bit of land, maybe a half a million people, and expand communism, what does the domino theory tell us? And if we allow this to happen here, it'll happen in the Netherlands, it'll happen in France, it'll happen in West Germany. That's the way communism works. Accurate or not, hard to say. You can't predict an alternate line for history. So what the United States does, starting in West Germany, lines up, I think it's close to a year of nonstop planes flying over East Germany, landing in the West German airport and delivering food and supplies. Now you might think, why did the Soviet Union, because remember the railroads and rolls are shut, why didn't the Soviet Union simply shoot down these planes as they come in? Because Harry Truman was a good card player. And Harry Truman said to Mr. Stalin, Mr. Stalin, you know that atomic bomb that we dropped in Japan only two years ago? I want you to be aware right now at this very moment, we've got about two dozen of them sitting in London on planes fully activated. I want to make something clear. One of our plane goes down, and it doesn't even have to be direct evidence that you shot it down. If one plane goes down, I will give orders, and all 24 of those atomic bombs will be dropped on Moscow without any further discussion. 
And Stalin, a sociopath in many ways, a smart enough guy to recognize he can't take on the United States. By the way, it was a bluff. The United States did not have a couple of dozen fully armed atomic bombs at this point. They take a while to build. They're very expensive. But it was enough. So for 300 consecutive days, I forget, 380 days, I don't remember, the planes came in, the planes came out. They landed every few minutes. West Germany finally remains non-communist. The Soviet Union decides the risk is not enough. The blockade is dropped. It does lead the United States to say, though, that, boy, I don't know, it's going to take more than money. So 1949, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is formed. That is the NATO Agreement. Mutual Protection Treaty, signed by the United States and Canada on one side of the North Atlantic and the countries of Western Europe. And you would know what the list are. There are a few that do not join. Sweden and Finland, for example, which are neutral countries, along with Austria. Spain, at that point, is still a fascist country, is not a part of NATO. But the whole idea is an attack upon one is an attack upon all. So that if the United States is attacked, Belgium will come to the rescue. Of course, that's not the way it is. It's that if there were to be an attack upon Italy, West Germany, France, etc., the United States, with its nuclear arsenal, will be there to fight back. We are obligated to go to war to protect each other. Notice what's changed. Within 10 years, we've gone from England about to be completely subsumed by the Nazi menace, but maybe we can loan you a few weapons to, you know what, we're going to give hundreds of millions of dollars to fight communism in uh, Turkey and Greece. Okay, yeah, Turkey and Greece, wherever that is, to, you know what, we are willing to risk war over West Berlin, a small sliver, to, you know what, any place in Europe. We will use force, if necessary, to stop the spread of communism. That is a huge jump in only 10 years. And by this point, the United States is feeling pretty confident about things. It is clear that the Soviet Union wouldn't dare to move its forces, either by itself or by proxy, into Western Europe. The United States has the nuclear monopoly. Perhaps the tide of communism is being stemmed. Soviets, by the way, respond to this a few years later with the Warsaw Pact, its own mutual defense organization with all the countries of Eastern Europe, minus Yugoslavia, which we'll get into. So this is how post-war Europe is set up. And I'll be honest, by this point, by the time we get to 1949, those borders are pretty set. There is relatively little likelihood of Hungary being invaded by Western Europe or France or Belgium being invested by the Soviet Union. The fighting is going to move to other parts of the world. So again, we look at our timeline, and here we are in 1949, the formation of NATO. But then 1949 hits. In September, the Soviet Union tests their own A-bomb. The United States explodes in terror. The Soviets now have this advantage. They could use this against us. And even though the United States still had an advantage militarily, number of bombs, etc., sends a major shockwave through the United States. And just when the United States is about to recover, only two months later, China is taken over by Mao Zedong and the Chinese Communist Party. And now you have not only one major power, the Soviet Union, that has adopted communism, that is spreading communism, you have now got, God help us, China as well, the largest population of the world dominated by communism. We're going to look at that in a separate section. The United States really recognizes communism is spreading. It's spreading from one country to the next, and the power, it's got the technology of the A-bomb. Something dramatic has to be done. Yeah, there is Joseph Stalin, Soviet Union's leader, till 1953 when he dies. That is actually a hydrogen bomb on the right. By the way, each hydrogen bomb that we have today, and there are 15 or 20,000 that are in the world today, each one is thought to be about seven to 800 times the power, perhaps a thousand times the power of the A-bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mao Zedong, we'll get to him, his ride to power, the long march. We've covered that a little bit in the past video lecture. 
So from the U.S. perspective, you have little tiny Western Europe with this giant communist menace, much of it's unoccupied, but looming over, perhaps forming forces with China as well. And keep in mind, much of Eastern Europe is also communist as well. In early 1950, there was an organization in the United States called the National Security Council that was formed a few years earlier along with the CIA. And it's basically a council of experts. It has no official policy authority. It can't make laws or policy, but it can advise. It includes military people. It's headed by the vice president of the United States, uh, um, international professors of international history and military and diplomacy and trade, etc. What they do is they study the conditions as they see them, and then they offer to the U.S. government policy recommendations. Each one of their reports was given a number. Number one was NSC number one, the next one was NSC number two, and in April of 1950, there is NSC 68. Now that is the 68th report of the National Security Council. When you move off to college, I would recommend more creative titles for your papers, but that's just me. This one argued a few things. It said, look, looking at what we've seen from the last five years, communism is spreading. Only the United States can stop communism. And the United States must fight communism, not just in Europe, but everywhere. And to fight communism, we need to be prepared to militarily intervene. Well, not two months later, there is a war that breaks out in Korea. Now, Korea, you might recall that the United States um, did not, the Soviet Union was ready to invade Japan three months after Hitler's surrender in May of 1945. You'll recall that almost the day, three months later, the first bomb is dropped on Nagasaki and the Japanese surrender nine days later. Uh, excuse me, Hiroshima is the first bomb and nine days later, the Japanese surrender. In that case, Japan was occupied entirely by the United States. In Korea, Soviet troops coming through China occupied the north part, and the southern part was occupied by the United States. By 1950, it is fairly clear these are two separate Koreas. What happens is war, we don't really, we'll probably go into this a little bit later if we have some time, but in effect, the communist North Korea launches an invasion on South Korea to unify the country. Now, NSC. 68, which had been given to the U.S. government as policy recommendation only two months earlier, had said to stop the spread of communism, the United States must be prepared to use armed forces to stop the spread. Here is a case where communism is making an attempt to spread. And according to the domino theory, if it goes from North Korea to South Korea, Japan, Indonesia, Vietnam, Laos, the Philippines, all of these could fall under the communist menace. The United States, through the United Nations, launches a three-year war to push these North Koreans back out of South Korea and nearly up to the border of China, at which point the Chinese, who by 1950 are now communists, decide to launch a counter-invasion and millions of Chinese soldiers flood into Korea, creating this three-year war. The war began with North and South Korea divided at the 38th parallel of latitude, and that's where it ends three years later. And to this day, as of June to April 2022, we still have a separate North and South Korea. We'll cover this again in a little bit more detail later. So post-war Europe is, in some ways, not that exciting a story in some ways. Um, you know, recovery, economic growth, yep, there, there is no war in Western Europe after World War II until what's going on right now in the Ukraine, which is, of course, Eastern Europe, but still at least a European state. We start seeing a mixed economies, in other words, a modified form of capitalism. You might remember John Maynard Keynes, government spending on, um, you know, health care and roads and schools and education, providing a safety net. 
all of the countries of Western Europe, after flirting with communism, with fascism, become par parliamentary democracies. Decolonization, we will look at separately. In other words, the colonies are going to disappear in the next five to 15 years. And yes, integration, starting with a common market, today's European Union, which involves most countries in Europe, um, is it on its way out? Is it finding a way to reformulate? It's definitely had some challenges in the past few years, but that's just a general look at post-war Western Europe. It is a prosperous time. It is a time where there is no conflict between states. And even today, the idea that France and Germany could enter a fourth war with each other seems unthinkable. There are still some, you know, memories from years ago it doesn't seem like it's possible. European countries, at least as far as we can tell, seem to be a point of one country invading another to be pretty darned unlikely. It doesn't seem in anyone's interests. And again, post-war Eastern Europe, you see the major countries, remember Yugoslavia is covered differently because it is not aligned with the Soviet Union despite being a communist country. This is, by the way, in East and West Berlin. And I want you to stop for a second. Where do you think, are these people in East or West Berlin? And is the building in East or West Berlin? And these are people in East Berlin apartments attempting to jump out of the windows into little nets that have been set up to freedom, as it were, in West Berlin. So this was at this point, these apartment complexes were right on the middle of the divided city. Uh, East Berlin, the East German government, the Soviet Union knocked them down and created a buffer zone. And eventually in 1961, a wall between the two Berlins. And the USSR, sure, you can call it Russia. It is strictly speaking, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics or the USSR or the Soviet Union, or again, Russia as the dominant force. It includes all of these areas. There's the Ukraine today, all of these areas that are strictly speaking, other socialist republics. Yes, independent from Russia, but nonetheless, this is all part of the Soviet Union. Um, others would call it an empire. The Soviet Union was quite clear. These are all countries that want to be part of this great Soviet experiment, um, more of an empire than anything else in the real world. So the Soviet Union war ends and Russians have lost 25, 30 million people. And there's a period under Stalin of pretty massive purging, imprisoning. These are the gulags out in Siberia, people sent to these inhumane conditions. And anybody who suspect, uh, prisoners of war were often immediately sent off to camps. Well, why? These people fought for the motherland. Yeah, but they came into contact with those decadent foreigners. They got some bad ideas. They can't be trusted, etc. The new ethnic groups, now that the Soviet Union has expanded, a lot of people don't speak Russian. They are not Eastern Orthodox Christian or atheist. They are in fact Muslims. They are ethnically different. Uh, Jewish people who had always been badly treated in the Soviet Union, by comparison, not as badly, I suppose, also seem to suspect. And again, any kind of idea that would question the supremacy of the Soviet Union. That's what these purges, these deportations, these gulags were set up for. We'd already looked at socialist realist painting, but remember the only purpose of art of literature is to serve the revolution. So, you know, here is Lenin calmly talking to a whole bunch of peasants about the wonders of scientific socialism. Um, certainly something that just expressed your own ideas or your own heart or something that in any way criticized the government. Good Lord, that would not be acceptable. So Stalin dies in 1953. Stalin's body count might match Hitler's in some ways. It's awfully hard to count these things, but pretty savage fellow. There is a power struggle. It's not like in the United States where the president dies, the vice president takes over, there's an election three years later or whenever it's scheduled. Uh, it is the head of the Communist Party who is the premier or head of the Soviet Union. And there is a power struggle that goes on for a few years until 1956, Nikita Khrushchev, his name is, takes control of the Communist Party, becomes the new leader. And then in a secret party conference in February of 1956, he announces the end of the Stalin era 
where he denounces Stalin as being brutal, as being abusive, as being an absolute monster, as somebody who destroyed the revolution rather than made it happen. Uh, Stalingrad, the place of the Great Siege during World War II, is renamed Volgograd after the Volga River, and Stalin becomes persona non grata. Little by little, this, this seeps out across Eastern Europe, and there are some changes, a little bit of economic opening, a little bit more free speech, certainly the horrifying gulags of the Stalin era, the purges, the mass executions, those seem to come to an end, but it's still a fairly repressive state. In terms of the West, you know, Stalin got along just fine with the United States during World War II, but the rhetoric was pretty high. Khrushchev says, you know, let's just acknowledge, you have your way, we have ours, perhaps we can move toward a peaceful coexistence, at least in theory. But there are a few incidents that certainly suggest it's not that peaceful. The U-2 incident is a U.S. spy plane, well, the Soviet Union, and Khrushchev announced, we have shot down a U.S. spy plane and captured the pilot. And the United States says, that's not true, we would never spy on you and they don't mention that they capture the person alive. And there he was, Francis Gary Powers, who's brought before Soviet, um, um, Soviet televisions and interviewed, and it is very, very clear that the Soviet Union did shoot down a US plane. The Soviets then become concerned about people that are leaving the Eastern Bloc countries to go to the West, and they're really going through West Berlin. If you can get from any of the Eastern European countries into East Germany, into East Berlin, you could simply find a way through there. Well, 1961, a massive wall is constructed, the Berlin Wall, which remains up for the next 28 years. And then the Cuban Missile Crisis, which we'll look at a little bit separately, but the Soviet Union sends weapons, nuclear weapons, to the island of Cuba, about 90 miles off the coast of the United States, that are armed and ready to be fired, and the United States makes it clear this will not happen. Um, the Soviet Union loses that, has to back down, ends up move, removing the weapons from Cuba, and Khrushchev has a vote of no confidence among the Communist Party leadership and is forced to leave. A man named Leonid Brezhnev with these horrific, horrific eyebrows takes over in 1964. Another major development, the Soviet Union in 1957 develops the first satellite which orbits the Earth. Now, it's the size of a basketball and it just goes beep, beep. But this leads to a panic in the United States. Look what the Soviet Union has done. They developed this technology. How long will it be so this thing can start firing nuclear weapons down at us? And the United States enters a major, major scientific and space technology race to try to quote unquote catch up with the Soviet Union. Honestly, the United States is pretty far ahead of the Soviet Union, but it does dumpstart an arms race and a technology race on both sides. I love that word Sputnik. Isn't that a great word? So in the Eastern European countries, you've got about 100 million people under communist control, in addition to Russia, in addition to China, in addition to North Korea, and then the areas where there are communist insurgencies around the world. And you know, some of this stuff works fairly well. The end of feudalism, feudalism has been dead. Well, not really in parts of Poland, Eastern Europe, et cetera, et cetera. The collectivist agriculture that the Soviet Union does, where we bring the state in to organize and produce, is imposed through much of Eastern Europe. And it probably in some ways is more efficient, but do notice that most of the benefits, or a lot of the benefits, go back to the Soviet Union themselves. Um, you know, people are eating within these countries. Some people are benefiting, but the standard of living remains far, far, far behind the West. And yes, one party state, there is a communist party and they run us. Again, from the Soviet perspective, democratic elections, look, what are people voting on? They're not voting on anything they really understand. It's which candidate has the most money or has the slickest media campaign. We are using the scientific ideas of Karl Marx to create a better society. And if people are not yet willing to understand this, we can't derail the whole revolution just because people are misinformed. So the idea of elections has never been terribly important in the communist world. Yugoslavia, the one major exception. Yugo means Southern, Slav means Slavic peoples formed after World War I. 
unbelievably diverse. There are Croats, Serbs, Bosnians, Slovenians, Macedonians, Albanians. There are Muslims, Catholics, Eastern Orthodox Christians. You pretty much name it. The guy that takes over is Joseph Tito, who was a communist fighter against the Nazis in World War II. And Joseph Tito was about as cuddly as he looks in that photograph. The guy wasn't. He wasn't, you know, he was a no-nonsense, pretty, pretty firm, pretty harsh. The one thing that he did, though, is that he held this society together. That if you were a Bosnian speaking out against a Serb, if you were a Serb speaking out against a Croat, you know what? You're creating disorder and instability, and we're not going to let this happen. Yugoslavia remained entirely separate from the Soviet Union, it had a non-aligned foreign policy. You might recall that in um, the very, very beginning of this class, we talked about the Bandung Conference in 1955 held in Indonesia. These were the non-aligned countries of the world. Well, Yugoslavia was invited because they were not a part of the Soviet realm. Um, the Soviet Union did not like this at all. The United States was willing to deal with Yugoslavia because, after all, they were not pro-Soviet Union. Um, as soon as the, the Iron Curtain falls, as soon as the Yugoslavia um, it, it, it abandons communism with the rest of Eastern Europe, Yugoslavia breaks into a series of ethnic-based and religious-based civil wars. Um, we'll get to that story in a moment. In Eastern Germany, there was a rebellion immediately, immediately 1953, crushed by the Soviets. You see people attempting to escape, not just East Germans, but people from other parts of East Europe get into East Germany, where it was possible to go as a fellow citizen of one of the Eastern Bloc countries, to East Germany, then to the West. And about two and a half million people leave. The United States, uh, excuse me, the Soviet Union and East Germany set up the Berlin Wall. It's an 86 mile wall that basically divides east from west. Um, that is the wall as it looked. I did actually see it when I was there in 1985, but uh, silly boy, I did not take pictures because that's not what I did because I was 20 years old and just kind of wandering around. But yeah, the little divide this. And you can see, well, this is West Berlin over here. If you want to escape from this apartment building from east to west, you don't simply jump out in the window into a net you'd have to go across this heavily armed no man's land. And it was virtually impossible to do. In one of the least inspiring moments of US world history, President John F. Kennedy announced the world his solidarity with the people of West Berlin. He said, ich bin ein Berliner. What he thought this meant is, I am a citizen of Berlin. Actually, with German, you don't use the indefinite article. So to say, I am a Ber Berliner in my heart or soul, it would be, ich bin Berliner. Ein means a type of donut called a Berliner. So technically speaking, the President of the United States announced the world that he was a jam-filled donut. Inspiring, for sure. Remember in February of 1956, do you remember what Nikita Khrushchev said about Joseph Stalin? The man was a monster. We need to make some dramatic changes. And you know what? Other countries in Eastern Europe hear about this and they start to respond. There is a mild revolt in Poland, not a, not a rebellion per se, but the Polish government says we're going to stop listening to the Soviet U Union. And, 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 and you know what? They they're able to get away with it, and the Soviet Union doesn't respond. This leads to Imre Naj, who is the premier of Hungary, announcing that Hungary is going to remain an ally of the Soviet Union, but make a pretty major break. Quote, a different road to socialism, a Hungarian road to socialism. We're going to start decentralizing the economy, opening it up quite a bit, and the Soviets don't seem happy with this, but they don't respond. They announce that the citizens will be able to elect a parliament, and the Soviet Union doesn't respond. They then announce that they will be withdrawing from the Warsaw Pact, basically becoming a Yugoslavia. And this for the Soviets is too much. They send in the military, and they absolutely crush the rebellion. 
Uh, 25,000 people killed was the estimate, tens of thousands more imprisoned, uh, further, what, 1,200 executions are the number that I have here. And this is a real turning point in some ways, because there were people in the West that said, look, I don't know about the Soviet Union, and Stalin was kind of a monster. This guy Khrushchev seems to be okay, you know, open mind. Maybe, you know, we hear that the Soviet bloc is repressive and horrible toward people. Eh, so much of that is propaganda. But this really turned a lot of people that might have been sympathetic to the Soviet Union. The idea that Eastern Europeans wanted to be a part of the Soviet bloc, this is something the Soviet Union claimed and the leaders of the East Europe, Eastern European governments also claimed we're doing this voluntarily. This really kind of made it less likely that such a thing was happening at this point. Um, it's also, we'll cover this later, it is during the same month in which there is a major crisis in the Suez Canal, where England, France, and Israel have basically taken over the Suez Canal from Egypt, and the United States forces its English, French, and Israeli allies to leave. And a part of the reason this was happening at the exact same time in Hungary. And for the United States, this was too good an opportunity to pass up. Look at us, the United States, standing up for Egyptian people against imperialism while the Soviet Union is doing this to Hungary. We'll come to that incident later. You know, there's always unhappiness. 1968 in Czechoslovakia, there is an attempt to do something different. Alexander Dubček was the prime minister of Czechoslovakia. After rebellions announced, you know what? We are still loyal communists, but we're gonna create socialism with a human race. And there are protests in the street and it looks like the Soviet dominated government of Czechoslovakia might fall. Once again, the Soviet Union decides we are not willing to do this. This is under Leonid Brezhnev. They send in the military. They put a stop to it. Dubček is arrested, sent off to prison. It is not as bloody as, as Hungary was, but it is still a pretty nasty invasion. By the way, I'd like you to do a little mental gymnastics. What happens if you take the numbers six and eight and flip them upside down? See if it's a little intelligence test. See if you can do this. What happens when you flip six, eight, upside down? The answer to come. The Eastern Bloc collapses. This is 1989. When you flip 68 upside down, it becomes 89. 21 years later, the Berlin Wall is torn down and communism disappears as the governing force in Eastern Europe. We'll come back to that in just a second. Leonid Brezhnev takes over in 1964 when uh, uh, Nikita Khrushchev is imposed. Again, look at those eyebrows. Are those intense or what? He is the leader of the Soviet Union for an 18-year period. Détente is a French word meaning relaxation. And there is a real attempt from the Soviet Union, and mostly responded to positively by the United States, to why don't we get along with each other? You know what, we, we're, we're not gonna go to war over Europe. We're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna invade West Germany. We're not gonna invade East Germany. We certainly have differences of opinions and interests around the world, but maybe we can start trade relations, diplomatic relationships, maybe talk about limiting these massive supplies of nuclear weapons, etc. The Prague Spring, that's the Czechoslovakia revolt in 68, happens during Brezhnev. In 1979, a colossal mistake, the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan. We'll talk briefly about that in a moment. And to ossify, that's your SAT word of the day, to become rock-like. Now, in theory, the Soviet economy was booming and the official newspapers talked about major economic growth. In reality, this was not happening. Uh, but you could not speak out against it. You know, Brezhnev ultimately, not as dynamic as Khrushchev, he was kind of a career Communist Party politician who just maintained the status quo, nothing too dramatic outside of that attempt to invade Afghanistan. Yeah, this is more complicated than we have time for, but in effect, a government takes over in Afghanistan, which does border the old Soviet Union, uh, that was non-communist. Khrushchev, uh, excuse me, Brezhnev announced the Soviet Union 
Biden is sending in troops to get rid of this new illegitimate government and install the rightful government of Afghanistan, which is friendly to the Soviet Union. Uh, the United States had done a similar thing in Vietnam in, in previous years, which we'll get to later. Well, what's the result of this? I mean, the Soviet Union is the second most powerful country in the world. It has nuclear weapons, has a massive population, and Afghanistan is really a bunch of peasant goat herders. I mean, this rocky terrain is one of the poorest countries in the world. There is no standing military, etc. This should take about 15 minutes for the Soviet Union to come in to Kabul, overthrow the government they don't want, install somebody else, and leave. You know what? This goes on for 10 years. The Soviets are able to kill a lot of Afghanis, but they cannot achieve their goals. What happens? First of all, detente. The U.S. and Soviet Union are buddies now. That kind of ends. Secondly, the United States has that idea that, you know what, our enemies' enemies are our friends. And the United States, because this is a proxy war, they're not going to go to war with the Soviet Union off of over Afghanistan and see this turn nuclear. That's not a possibility. But what they are willing to do is to simply fund guerrilla armies. And they mainly focus on what we call the Mujahideen which are Islamic warriors. These are Islamic people, not just from Afghanistan, the so-called Afghan Arabs that come in from the Middle Eastern countries, from Saudi Arabia, that see communist Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan as an attack upon the world of Islam. The United States enforces a grain embargo, stops trading with the Soviet Union. This is the Soviet Union's Vietnam, because the Soviet Union loses this conflict. It destroys the images and really the image and the economy of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union is forced to withdraw in 1989, having achieved none of its goals. Afghanistan is in chaos and the Taliban, who just last year came back into power, is able to set up using the weapons supplied by the United States. And among the people that were founded by, funded by the United States was this gentleman. A young Saudi kid, part of a great big family trip. I believe this was taken in Sweden. This is an incredibly wealthy Saudi family, extended family, went on a massive, massive shopping spree to Sweden. This is Osama bin Laden, young teenager, raised to be pro-Western, raised to be very wealthy. Eventually, as we'll explain later, pulls back away. The founder of Al-Qaeda, the attack on 9-11 on the World Trade Center etc. Poland had always been rebellious. Remember, it's a deeply religious country, very, very, very Catholic. There was an attempt to revolt against the Soviet Union in 1956. That does not really, it's not quite as bloody as Hungary, but it is somewhat. As you start seeing the Soviet Union breaking down, the Catholic Church makes a major political move. For the past 500 years, the Pope had always been Italian, always, always. Well, Cardinal Wotivia, is named Pope John Paul II, and he is Polish. Solidarity was an independent labor union. You are not allowed in Soviet-sponsored countries to have your own labor unions. You are part of a union, but it was funded by the Communist Party, and you didn't have your own policy. A man named Lech Walesa began to argue that working people deserve better, can be independent of the government. Uh, the year that I graduated from high school, there was a major, major rebellion. Protests were growing, and the military came and declared martial law and put an end to this. And this was the end. Lech Walesa, the other Solidarity members went off to prison. That was the end of that revolt. Keep in mind that the Soviet economy, the Eastern European economies, aren't as strong as they're pretending. And that war in Afghanistan, which began three years earlier, isn't going very well. And it's getting expensive and it's getting embarrassing. Yeah, there's the declaration of Pope John Paul visiting. I don't know where that is. I don't recall this. Lech Valenza there, and there you see the Declaration of Martial Law, which will put an end to the protests in Poland for about seven years. Yeah, we call this the age of the decrepit Soviet ruler, and in some ways symbolize what was happening. That's Leonid Brezhnev and his wonderful, wonderful, wonderful eyebrows. I've never seen anything like this. It's like a, a bird flew into his face and became ossified, doesn't it? Well, he dies in 1986, something like that. I don't recall the exact year. So they replace him with Yuri Andropov, who was in his late 70s. 
and he survived a couple of months and he died. So Konstantin Chernyenko also takes over, who looks like an older Russian woman in that photograph, not the most flattering of photographs, takes over also in his late 70s and he dies within a couple of months. It sort of suggests in the Soviet Union, we've had one, two, three leaders in their 70s and 80s, and none of them can do the most basic thing necessary for government, which is stay alive. This leads to the Communist Party of Russia making a fairly bold decision. A young man, doesn't look that young, but he's in his early 50s as opposed to late 70s. He was the first premier, the first Communist Party head that was born after the 1917 revolution. So this is a new generation. Gorbachev, look, he's ex-KGB, which is the Soviet Union's version of the CIA. He is a dyed-in-the-wool communist believer in the socialist system, absolutely. But he's also recognizing things aren't going as well as we like to pretend. So he announces two general policies, both are Russian words. One is perestroika, in which we're gonna make some changes to the economy. We're not gonna have a free market capitalist system where people buy and sell what they want and they waste resources and there's inequality, no. But we're gonna open it up some. We're gonna give people some opportunities for private ownership and trade with other countries, more of an emphasis on consumer goods because life is not just having plenty of borscht to eat. You also want to have television sets, etc. And then glasnost, a political opening. You mean you can say anything that you want to, including attacking the Soviet government? No, 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 no. But it's an opening and it allows some voices to come out. Gorbachev's ideas is that these modest openings will take the pressure off, help to rejuvenate the Soviet system, and it will continue for decades or centuries to come. In reality, this is a Pandora's box. You let these things out of the box, it leads to other changes that can't be controlled. If you had told me in 1985 that the Soviet Union would be dissolved completely within six years and communism no longer a government political force anywhere in Europe, I would have sent you to a mental health facility. Yet this is exactly what happens. <clears throat> Worth mentioning, because it's been in the news lately, uh, nuclear power, which on one hand is a non-fossil fuel, non-greenhouse gas creating and completely renewable form of energy, which sounds great. However, it produces incredibly radioactive and deadly waste, and there's the concern about what will happen if a nuclear power plant is damaged. We saw this happen seven, eight years ago in Japan with the Fukushima plant, and that is still creating massive releases of radiation. I don't think we even know the results of this. In Chernobyl in 1986, there was a major explosion at a nuclear power plant. Now, the Soviet Union said, no, no problem. This happened in Ukraine, not a problem. Uh, nobody killed on the ground. It's been contained. In fact, we know that this is not the case. We know that thousands of people died, mainly from radiation, cancer, perhaps even tens or even hundreds of thousands. We don't really know. Um, most of this was largely covered up. The whole area around Chernobyl is basically just a dead zone now. Uh, people don't live there. People don't farm there. It is too radioactive. During the recent Russian invasion, in fact, the soldiers went through Chernobyl and, in fact, with the tanks and the vehicles, released some of the radiation from the ground. What I'm understanding is that that is not actually a major, major, major concern, but definite worries about an invading army taking over a radioactively contaminated uh, power zone, for sure. So the Soviet Union, I mean, again, if it's 1985 and you say, hey, five or six years, Soviet Union will disappear, it doesn't make any sense. In retrospect, a lot was happening. First of all, the difficulties of the rising ethnic conflicts. Oh yes, we are no longer nationalities. We are one brotherhood of people, the working people together. But you know what? The Lithuanians, the Estonians, the Latvians, the Chechnyans, the Ukrainians, the Belarusians, the Moldavians, the people from the stands, the Uzbekis, the Tajikis, etc. Those who are loyally Muslim, those who are different forms of Christian, you know what? It, it, that was always going to be a problem. It is a problem with empire. How do you keep people from so many different backgrounds satisfied? The economy, 
on paper, it looked fantastic, guys. Every official report showed economic growth. And you know what? It just wasn't happening. People did not live as well in Eastern Europe as they did in Western Europe. Uh, the economy was slowing down. You know, Afghanistan, especially coming from the Soviet Union, spent a lot of money and also made a lot of people, it appears, in the Soviet Union saying, what are we doing? Why are we invading this country? Who are we to do this? Are we really the good guys? And the United States begins with Ronald Reagan taking office in 1981, a massive military buildup, which the Soviet Union felt they had to do as well. And there is a major arms race in the 1980s. Now, whether this was the U.S. intention or not, the Soviet Union kind of spent its way into bankruptcy because the military is very expensive to maintain and it doesn't bring as much back. And then you've also got what we call refuseniks. Refuseniks, Nick just suggests that's Russian. Uh, these are dissidents, high profile, scientists, etc. A couple are named there. You've definitely gotten the ongoing opposition. And with Gorbachev's glasnost uh, reforms, there's a little bit more of an avenue for voice. So the fact is, this is never one big happy society. The economy was really hurting, certainly made worse by Afghanistan, and those ongoing voices of opposition are there. In 1989, Poland holds its first free elections. Now, the military government of Poland knew that they were going to win, and they didn't worry much about it. And they were shocked. They got clobbered. The Communist Party won two seats in the parliament and there is this immediate panic and are we going to let this happen and you know what the cat's out of the bag but the question is now that the polish have elected a non-communist government what's the soviet union going to do now in 1956 we know what they did in hungary they sent in the military and crushed it and in 1968 they sent in the military to crush the revolt in czechoslovakia in 1989 People are waiting. Mikhail Gorbachev decides to stand back and let the election stand. And that sends a message to East Germany, Romania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia. Maybe things are different. Maybe 68 turned upside down. 89, the world has turned upside down. In August of 1989, Austria and Hungary opened their borders. Now remember, Austria is a neutral country. Hungary is bordering Austria, is a communist country. Notice what happens. Hundreds of thousands of East Germans go into Hungary, which they're allowed to do, go on vacation to Austria, and they don't come back. Again, what's the Soviet Union going to do? 20 years ago, we know what they would have done. They would have sealed the borders. They would have sent the tanks. But this is not happening, partially because the Soviet Union is still at war in Afghanistan. I'll say this many times. If you ever become the president or leader of your country, wherever it might be, two bits of advice. One, don't invade Russia, because that's what Napoleon and Hitler learned. Two, don't invade Afghanistan, who was invaded by the British repeatedly in the 19th century, and it nearly destroyed the British Empire. It did play a role in destroying the Soviet Empire in the 1970s and 80s, and the United States made the same mistake in 2002. And once again, the United States took a real beating in Afghanistan. You know what, rule number three, don't invade anybody. It's a lousy thing to do. November 9th, it's only a couple months later, the East German authorities, because protests are gathering, say, you know what? We're going to ease restrictions. We're going to let people travel between the two Germanys, East and West, because they're feeling the pressure. And the response to this is hundreds of thousands of East and West Germans climbing up onto the wall, ignoring the checkpoints, climbing up and eventually coming with sledgehammers and destroying it. And the East German military and the Soviet Union stand back and watch it happen. It is clear the Iron Curtain is falling. Uh, it's officially a year later that Germany becomes one country once again. It is no longer East Germany and West Germany. When I say the Mauer im Kopf, 
that is the wall in the head that East and West Germans had developed so differently for 50 years that there remained some conflicts between them, but that's not really worth going into right now. Well, now you have Poland, which has abandoned communism, Germany, which has reunified, and there you see dramatic photographs of the Berlin Wall falling. Yugoslavia, much the same. Tito dies about 1985, 86, something like this. And, well, you know what? We Yugoslavians are also going to abandon communism. Um, however, the Serbians and the Croats who had been held together in Yugoslavia and held together by the force of Tito, they find that they don't really have a lot of love for each other. Serbians are East Orthodox Christians and Croatians tend to be more Catholic and all, you know, differences in language and all of these things. Um, you end up seeing absolute chaos in Yugoslavia, a series of civil wars that occur over the next decade or so. Uh, Croatia, Bosnia, Slovenia, Serbia, uh, Montenegro is the newest. Kosovo is a new nation now as well. Almost immediate bloodshed. I can't go into much detail about this, but one of the things that you do see is for all the joy of communism falling apart in Yugoslavia. And there was a pretty repressive regime. There's no question about this. It's hard to argue that things suddenly became better because, you know, the, the violence among these very different groups had been held in check, etc. So you can certainly find out more about this, but the United States and NATO were actually involved in putting an end to an ethnic cleansing or attempting to do so fairly detailed and fairly even controversial, but we'll just let you know that this happened. Romania was the only Eastern Bloc country that left the Soviet sphere without with, with violence. Uh, Prime Minister Ceausescu, just a, a vicious, horrific, horrific character for many years, probably the nastiest of these dictators, uh, had maintained, basically had maintained control until the end. There's finally a mob that overthrows him. I think my face is covering it here, but eventually people break into the presidential palace and execute him and his wife, and Romania, again, breaks free of the Soviet Union entirely as well. That's in late 1989. So you see all these countries, you can stop and look at these maps and you can see in, 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 in uh, blue, this is when you see a brand new society, brand new country, 1989 to 1990 is when all these countries break through and the Soviet Union becomes simply the Soviet Union and not with its Eastern European satellites. And even the Soviet Union does not survive the next couple of years. The economic problems continued. Gorbachev's reforms don't seem to do much more than give people ideas. The Eastern European satellites, the fact that East Germany and Czechoslovakia and Hungary are not there to support and strengthen the Soviet economy is a problem. Hardline communists begin, who never liked Gorbachev in the first place, begin to go after him and attack. Do you see? You've abandoned communism. Do you see what's happening? Gorbachev, I remember being at a boss of mine's retreat, he went out on his lake and went out and I tried uh, windsurfing and it didn't work, came back in to turn on the TV and there was a military coup that had attempted to overthrow Gorbachev. He was taken prisoner and the hardline communist military was taking over again. Boris Yeltsin, who is the mayor of Moscow, rallies people in the streets. He seems the figurehead of this and basically forces the military to stand down. Gorbachev is brought back into power very briefly, but is forced to leave almost immediately. And Boris Yeltsin becomes the new president. Not simply, oh, I didn't really mean to do that. Let's see if I can still just go back. Boris Yeltsin becomes the new president in December of 1991 of the Russian Federation. Let me try going back. I'm not sure if this is going to work. You know, we're talking now. It's not going to let me do that. That's too bad. Well, what I had on there was the effect. You can uh, slow it down if you want to. Is the mental backpack. When you think about why empires fall apart. We had talked about this at the beginning of the class. You can apply this to the Soviet Union economic problems, public protest, invasions or pressures from outside, um, over expanding. You certainly see this, the Soviet Union not only trying to take over all of Eastern Europe and expand, but also into Afghanistan, etc. Again, I wish I had been aware that I put this there. 
So you have a new Russian Federation as of 1991, a name that you're very familiar with, Vladimir Putin, takes charge in 2001 and has basically been in charge of the country now for 21 years. Putin is strictly speaking not a communist, but certainly very authoritarian. And again, I think those labels of communist capitalist don't matter an awful lot. Russia remains a fairly powerful country. It is a, you know, it's a big economy, but has had certainly growing economic problems, has had problems keeping control over the Russian Federation, which does include a lot of other um, a lot of other uh, ethnicities as well. And I think you're also seeing too, with this invasion of Ukraine, something of a desperate move from the Russians. Russia has a huge oil and natural gas supply, but otherwise has had a whole lot of problems. So this brings us up to the year 2000, which is where the AP class closes. Looks like I took another 15 minutes on this, but that is going to happen. Not, not so bad, hour and 15 minutes. Remember, you can just play my voice a little bit faster. I'll sound like a chipmunk but you'll get through it faster. Bye.